Hello and welcome back to the 50th episode of On That If I Want To. That makes us coming up on almost a whole year of these. Um, so if you're new here, welcome. This is where I try to answer your questions about knitting and spinning and just random things. Um, but yeah, it started off actually as an accompaniment to the DRK March to May Knit Along, which starts next week again. This will be our third annual one. Um, so I'll talk more about that in a little bit, but basically it just started as a weekly Q&A to kind of be a fun thing to do during the knit along and then I just never stopped. So I can't believe that we're coming up on a year of this. I hope that you're still enjoying them and finding them interesting. There's still loads of questions for me to answer. I've got quite the spreadsheet. Thanks to all of you filling out the form and asking some of your burning questions. If you have a question you would like me to attempt to answer, you can go into the show notes below this video and um, at the very bottom, there's a link to ask a question. You can go fill out the form. That is the best way. If you email me or leave it in the comments, they just get kind of lost by the time I'm picking questions for the following week. So definitely go the route of the form. And yeah, DRK March to May and Shifty 2.0. So we have lots of fun things to talk about this week. Um, let's start with the knit along. So I'll probably actually do an extra little video chatting all about the knit along. Maybe I'll do that. I'll do that. But anyways, it's super fun and we focus on sweaters and shawls. It used to be just sweaters for the first year and then I had lots of requests to include shawls. So now we have two forums going. Um, there's lots of people. It's a great way to make friends and to have people cheer you on while you knit. So I hope you'll come join us. I did leave some links to the forums below. You can also participate on Instagram. So that's also written below. Um, but I'll do a whole separate little video and I will try to remember to come back and link that below too once I've recorded it. So keep an eye out. I'll throw it out into my newsletter too so that you can find it. And Shifty 2.0. So, I actually got a good shifty question to answer in a little bit, but um, this is my second shifty. I designed the original shifty sweater about three years ago, and it is one of the very first round. It was actually the first just round yoke kind of classic pullover that I designed. Um, I designed wool and honey before this, if memory serves, but that is a very different kind of round yoke sweater. I almost wouldn't put them in the same camp. <laughs> um, but through some amazing feedback from knitters all over the world, there I knew I could make it better. This last year, I feel like I unlocked some of the keys to a really nice um, fitting yoke across all the sizes that I offer. And so I actually went back and basically started from scratch and completely rewrote the pattern to a different gauge. Um, there's more sizes available now and I think that it fits really, really nicely. All of my test knitters were thrilled with the outcome across all of the sizes. So that was really, really exciting. I pushed out that update this week on Tuesday. So if you've already purchased the pattern on Ravelry, you would have automatically gotten the update. If you happen to have bought Shifty over on my website, um, I shared in my newsletter and on Instagram, you can just send me an email with the email address you used or your order number and I can push the update out to you that way. You don't have to rebuy the pattern. It's just getting a refresh. Um, but I'm really excited to continue learning and always trying to make my patterns the absolute best they can be. I want you to have as much fun as possible while knitting them but I also want I think an important part of that is confidence that it's gonna fit you really well at the end so I hope that if you have been wanting to knit shifty that now you can and that you love it um, and you love wearing it so let's jump into some questions because I it, it is about shifty the first one um, just lost my train of thought for a second there. Did you watch it? Did you watch it fly, fly out of my brain and then whoop, come back? Okay, so question number one. Can we talk about choosing colors for the Shifty sweater? I have been wanting to knit this sweater for a couple years and get totally stuck on choosing colors. 
Um, I'd also like to use my hand spun, but this question applies to the spin cycle dyed in the wool too. The yarn has a lot of variation within the skein. How do you choose the main colorway and then the secondary colorways? Should there be a color in common between them? I actually am gonna grab a little yarn real quick. So I'll just keep talking while I do this. And then grab these and then grab these. And then grab these. Okay. So I just happened. So I have hinted here before that I am working on a shifty cardigan and there has been some roadblocks along the way, let me tell you, <laughs> but I, I am still, still working on it. So it will happen. I'm not going to give up. Um, but I have learned a few things in regards to mosaic knitting and this type of yarn, hand spun or um, spin cycle, which is very similar to hand spun. They actually started as a hand spinnery if you're not familiar with their yarns. And so that's how they create these like beautiful color shifting colorways um, in lovely skeins like this. And yeah, so there's been some bumps along the road that I have figured out, um, but I think I finally have a solution, which is very exciting. So stay tuned for that. So anyways, I have piles of yarn in preparation for that newest experiment. But let's get back to color. So for this sweater, and this would also apply well to the shift cowl. So this is what began all the shifting a few years ago was this cowl. And so this cowl came to be out of um, spin cycle yarns. I'm just going to add this to my ensemble. <laughs> it actually looked quite nice together. Ah, I'm very pleased. Um, so they were kind of challenging me to fade with their yarns. But if you've used spin cycle yarns before, then you know, I'm just trying to look like a really good example. Um, let's, so if you've used their yarns before, they are variegated yarns. They dye them in the wool. So that means they actually dye the fiber before spinning it. And so no two skeins will ever be the same. They are all unique. They're all their own little butterflies and you can't really control what happens with the color. I know many people who try to control what happens with the color, but when it comes to this kind of yarn and hand spun yarn, if you're choosing um, to spin up kind of like a fun, colorful braid in like a fractal spin, this is gonna be kind of the closest to that spin cycle style. Um, be kind of, in my opinion, and opinions vary. Uh, I feel like you just gotta like strap in and go for the ride and then <laughs> what comes will come, you know? Um, but I do have friends who will cut out sections of yarn like this and only like to try and control it. But to me, it's too precious. I don't wanna waste it. So I just let it ride. But so when fading with the yarn, it is tricky. I couldn't do what I did with like speckled yarns like I did with Find Your Fade or Free Your Fade or things like that because I wasn't in complete control of the yarn. So then it became this exploration of one of my absolute favorite things to do, which is why we have my fade patterns and my shifty patterns, um, is just moving from one color to the next. I think visually that is my favorite within anything. I love seeing just like that movement of color sparks joy in me. It really is just like makes me feel very excited and I think keeps me coming back to especially knitting and spinning um, because it's just so fun and the possibilities are so endless. So I digress. Um, so I decided to use texture through mosaic knitting, I used, it has a um, stockinette background, but then it has these little pearl bumps. Um, so I used texture to kind of push the movement of using colors like this that you can't fully control. But I still start with basically a gradient is how I started with the shift. And that's also basically what I did with shifty. So I picked a semi, like, what I consider a neutral, I think anything can be a neutral. <laughs> um, so for this one, I used their Nocturne and Brown Sugar, which is, I wish I had a skein of it right here. Um, it's basically kind of like an ochre yellow 
um, slowly shifting their nocturne base is dyed over gray fiber and so it's a lot moodier and deeper and the colors are a little more subtle as far as the color transitions so it worked really really nice as a backdrop for the original shifty i used grumpy grumpy birds which is about as neutral as you can get with their yarn it is um very muted and there's a little bit of orange a little bit of blue it's pretty beigey um, so anyways, I picked what I like a neutral, but I mean, sky's the limit. So basically you want to pick, I would start with your main color and then I would pick your contrast colors. I would try and go for a gradient if you want. That's what I would do. Um, and I would just have them, you know, match up nicely with your main color. So for instance, I have here, this is Mel, oh no, this is Leith, or is it Leith? Hmm, I don't know. Um, but this is, you can see there's less color variation going on in this skein. Um, but it doesn't have to be, that's just one example. And then these are the colors I've picked to go with it. So I have Deep Bump, Family Jewels, and Small Wonder. So you can tell here I'm staying within a family. So these are all bluish greens. And you can tell that these kind of fade nicely. So this minty color is represented in my middle color. While then with my third color, we share some of these oranges and some of the blues. You can't tell so great in this light, but this one's actually quite a bit darker than the middle one. So I just kind of created a little gradient. And again, staying within one color family. Now, you could also kind of jump. So here's another little gradient I put together. This is actually one of the prizes for the knit along. Um, so this is the Saddest Place, Heliotrope, and Verba Volant. And this could even look great. You could go, you could pair this little gradient with, um, I just lost all my words for a second there. I apparently need more coffee today um, with its contrast colors. So you should, you could go with like brown sugar. Like I did with this one, you could go with like a mustardy yellow kind of like similar here. That's represented right there. Um, or you could go for like, they have another colorway that I'm forgetting the name of, but it is, see, you could even do this. There's, it's like more purpley and darker than this. Um, but basically I look for something in those contrasts to kind of tie it to its main color um, and just create gradients. So that's what I do. I feel like I got, I, I was hopping around all over the place with that one. Um, should there be a color in common between them? Yeah, so that's basically it. I. And you can, you know, I said I would start with the main color. You could absolutely start with your gradient and then just decide what do I want to do? Do I want to keep this all within the same color family, maybe go on heavy on the purples? Or do I want to really make these colors pop by then reaching for a more yellow based um, main color that will be a contrast to these. So it kind of depends on how bright you want it to be. But I also highly recommend looking at the shifty hashtag. Um, it's just shifty sweater or the shift cowl. You could also look at projects on Ravelry. Um, I think that's a great way to get color inspiration because you can go see like one of my favorites, which is what led to this is I really, really love oranges and blues together. So that's where I started with this. I knew I wanted to play around with something that had some oranges and blues. So that's why I grabbed that. I actually thought, oh my gosh, it's there on my lap. <laughs> okay, so here's another example. Um, so for this, I wanted to go that contrast route. So I actually picked these oranges. Um, we have Stay Out of the Forest and Mississippi Marsala and Castaway. And all of these have in common some reddish, orangish, and blue. And they go, you know, dark, medium, light. And then this would be the main color. So this is gonna be a lot brighter. It's gonna have a greater impact because it is more high contrast. Um, orange and blue are opposites on the color wheel. Um, so that's another fun, fun way to do it. So the options are endless. The great thing is 
I don't think I've ever seen an ugly one. You know, like you can really play around with color um, thanks to that texture and yeah, it's just really fun. Okay, so I'm trying to think if there's anything I left out about the changes to this sweater. I don't think so. Okay, next question. I have a question about testing, test knitting sweaters for designers. Many patterns say to choose a size based on bust circumference, but since I'm more pear shaped and prefer sweaters to hit at my hips, I tend to choose a size based on that circumference instead. Do you think designers would be disappointed if I tested a size that would be a looser fit than they'd like to see? Especially since many request modeled photos posted on Ravelry or Instagram? I realize that at least some part of a designer's intention for test knitting is to advertise their designs, so a sweater fitting how they want may be important to them, but I would also love to participate in test knits. I'm prepared for the brutal truth. So um, I can only answer for myself, but personally, let's kind of define test knitting. So test knitting for me is I put out a testing call and I do this in the Ravelry forums um, and in my group. Um, and I basically just pick an array of people. I try to get like one to two people per size. It's usually at least two people per size. And my goal with test knitting is just to see if that knitter felt like the pattern was fun to knit and intuitive to follow and if they liked their finish knit. So I think sometimes there's confusion between test knitting, sample knitting, and tech editing. So a tech editor is somebody that, like I have my tech editor and I pay her to check my patterns for technical errors. So they make sure that the math adds up, they make sure that there's continuity. I sometimes, you know, sometimes you like write something a certain way and then all of a sudden you start writing it the same direction a little bit different. And so they help make sure that there is this um, continuous flow throughout the patterns and that it's technically correct. So that is their job. That is not the job of a test knitter. A test knitter's job is not to catch errors in a pattern. Um, sometimes there are things that slip through the fingers of both the designer and the tech editor, uh, but it's not the job of the test knitter to do that. They're really just getting an early, early free copy of the pattern to let us know like, yeah, that was fun, or actually I found this confusing, or mm, the fit wasn't great, or oh, I love how it fits. You know, like that's my goal with test knitting. And then there's sample knitters, and sample knitters are actually have to knit the pattern exactly as written. The yarn is provided to them because they do not get to keep it, and they're paid by yard, typically is how it goes. Um, to knit that and then send it back to the designer or the company or whoever's paying them to knit that sample. Um, so, and again, their job is not to find errors in a pattern or anything like that. That's the tech editor. So here, these are like the different categories. Um, so for a test knitter, again, I want, like for me, I like to have a varied group of knitters because I like to see, okay, I have my experienced knitters who might go into autocorrect mode or be really comfortable with modifications or they're just going to kind of blow through the pattern probably pretty easily, even if it's more advanced. And so then it's nice to have some beginner knitters who might have questions pop up or like need more clarification because the longer you've been designing patterns also for me, I always want to stay where I began, which was as a knitter following patterns. And I used to rewrite every pattern I bought. I used to rewrite it like for how I read it easier and worked it um, in my notebook. And so I try to come from that place of um, really anticipating areas that might be confusing or um, a little more challenging to navigate and giving all the information I can. And I wanna stay in that mindset. So sometimes it can be really helpful to have like a beginner knitter or some, you know, a newer knitter in there trying to read it and coming across terms they're not familiar with. But probably most importantly 
is, especially when it comes to sweaters, is people of different sizes and different shapes. Because you can have people who might pick the same size whose body shape is wildly different. You know, like we vary so much. And thankfully with knit fabric, it's a very flexible fabric. Um, and depending on the design, you really do want to see it on different body shapes. And for me, like, again, I don't ask, um, I don't say you have to post photos or a project page. I really like it when they, when testers do, because I want other people who might share their body shape to be able to look at how that garment fit on that person to determine if that's a good sweater for them. Like, oh, their body shape's really similar to mine and I love how that looks on them. Or, um, so to me, just because you're more pear shaped, I would want you to naturally navigate, like pick this pat size you would pick as if you had bought the pattern and were planning to knit it. Um, because that might show other pear shaped people. Okay. I went for my hip circumference and, um, this is how I felt about the fit. That was a really, really long answer. <laughs> But I just think it's a it's a conversation that I think there are a lot of questions around. And I do, I really, for me personally, love to see people of all different body shapes and sizes and what sizes they would choose. Um, and yeah, I, did, I, did I get there in the end? Did I answer the question? I hope so. Basically, yes throw your hat in and I do not see why the only time where I think a designer might have an issue is if you go radically off of the recommended ease and fit because I think I've only had that happen once where somebody signed up for a size that had way more positive ease than was recommended. And then they were like, well, I don't like how this fits. And I was like, well, <laughs> you didn't, <laughs> you picked a size that you shouldn't, <laughs> that wasn't recommended. You know, they were, they were like, what? So I think just keeping that in mind is those recommendations are there for a reason. You know, that designer, um, we do have an idea of how it's graded, especially in proportions to itself. So like sleeve proportion to bust proportion to hip proportion. Um, those are all taken into account when grading. And so you just have to keep that in mind that all of the proportions change. It won't only affect your bust area. All right. Sorry, that one was a bit of a, of a ride I took you on there, but I hope it gave some helpful information. All right, my question is, I have only knit scarves, shawls, and cowls, and I'm intimidated by sweaters. I'm fine doing color work, but it's the shaping of sweaters that scares me. I don't know how to assess a pattern to decide how advanced it is and whether it'd be a good first one to knit. Any tips? So I have mentioned this before, but for me personally, I, on all of my pattern pages at, in the details section, at the bottom, there's a section called techniques to indulge in. And I try to list any special techniques, even basic ones like knitting, purling, um, that you will need to be comfortable with or have a desire to learn to knit that pattern. I find, um, trying to give patterns like a rating of difficulty to me isn't very helpful because it's all relative. There are certain techniques that for certain knitters come real easy breezy and for somebody else totally stumps them. You know, for instance, like I love brioche and can breeze right through it, but I know other people find it really challenging. Where for me in my earlier days of knitting, yarn overs for some reason really caught me up. I actually did them wrong for a couple of years. When I finally unlocked that though, I was like, whoa, now I get it. I can't believe I just was making a really silly mistake, but I didn't have anyone to kind of see what I was doing. So I just kept making that mistake. Um, so I just think it's relative. And I think that people, that knitters, 
are better equipped to decide for themselves if a pattern is with the, is within their difficulty range by seeing what techniques they might need to be able to do in a pattern. So that is how I do that. So um, that is what I would say is go through any sweaters that catch your eye that you love that you're interested in knitting and then just check out, check out those techniques. Um, <clears throat> I try really hard whenever there is a tricky technique to do a little tutorial video. So you can find a lot of those on my YouTube channel here. Um, there's, I have a knitting tutorial playlist and a brioche playlist, a um, half fisherman's rib playlist. So you can check out those tutorial videos. Um, but even just doing a little Google search for any techniques you're not familiar with and watch a video and decide for yourself, like either try it out on a swatch or decide like, oh yeah, I think I could manage that. That doesn't seem so bad. Um, as far as patterns to start with, I think my DRK everyday sweater is a really great one. That is a round yoke, super simple pullover. It's probably like right at the top of my favorite sweaters. I wear it at least a couple times a week. Um, a lot of people have done the Weekender as their first sweater. The tricky thing about that one is really just the cast on and bind off, but you can absolutely sub in a different cast on and bind off. You can keep that real simple. And as far as the shaping goes, if you've done shawls, you can do a sweater because it's just increasing and decreasing. I mean, even if you've done a hat, I feel like you're already getting pretty well equipped to jump on the sweater train. Um, so you can do it and I think you should. And especially like if you can do color work, if you can manage yarn and all that, you're gonna be great. So I hope that's helpful. Next question. How do you tell if you've got the yoke fit right when trying on a top-down sweater? I made your striped sweater, love it, but was confused when trying on the yoke after sleeve sp split. For my next sweater, metamorphic, yay! Um, what should I look for in the yoke depth? Should it reach a certain point on your front or back? Where should the collar be sitting? And how do you tell if you have too much positive ease? Any tips for this beginner would be great. So. This is a tricky one um, because so much affects the fit of that yoke as the sweater progresses. So let's start with probably the easiest part to answer, which is yoke depth. That is a personal preference, but for me, I prefer at least an inch, if not two inches below my underarm. So when I am trying on a yoke and I love to use these little, the knitting barber cords. They've really been like a game changer. Not, not even exaggerating. <laughs> it's made my life so much easier. Um, so basically you just pop one end. Let me see if I have my knitting needle. Let me do it for my socks here. So you just pop one end of this little silicone cord onto your needle tip and it locks on and then you can just slide your needle through so that it's really easy to just pop it on and try it on. So um, I make sure I kind of pull it down a little bit and just make sure that it is deep enough for what I like. The pattern's also gonna tell you approximately how deep that yoke should be recommended for you for that size and where to measure from. So that should all be included in the pattern. Um, but yeah, so I like, you know, one to two inches. If you're gonna layer a sweater, you might even want a little more. I mean, you don't wanna have a shirt on underneath that you feel like it's like kind of bunching, getting stuck because it's like too tight up in your armpit <laughs> and your underarm. That's a very, that's a nicer way to say it than your armpit. Um, and then I kind of just bring it down. The tricky thing, especially if you still have like a needle in there that has a bit of a stiffer cord, is that if you, it's not going to lay exactly how it's going to lay when the sweater's finished, but you can get a pretty good idea, like if it's giant or not, depending on how much ease you want. That is a little bit going to come with practice and with trying it and with knitting more sweaters and then seeing the fit that you really, really like. That is another good tip actually going back to yoke depth. 
I would recommend when you have knit one that you really, really love that yoke depth, measure that and write it in your knitting journal or in a note on your phone um, somewhere so that you know for future sweaters, okay, this is the yoke depth I really like that really works for my wardrobe because I like to layer a lot or I never layer, or, you know, whatever it may be. Um, and the collar, again, I mean, a lot of this is personal preference. Um, and so collar is going to open up with blocking a little bit. So, um, that is one thing to consider, but some people really don't like a high neck. I actually do like a fairly high neck on my sweaters. I like a more modest neck, um, depending on the sweater, but, um, okay. So the thing I do want to keep in the back of your mind though, is how much sleeves affect the fit of that yoke. It's pretty amazing. Like you could try on a yoke and it might be up a little bit high. Maybe that neck's kind of high or even feels like a little bit close. Um, and once you knit those sleeves, they completely kind of like pull the sweater down and right to where it needs to be. So that's the only thing I would just remember is that blocking and sleeves are definitely going to affect that yoke and the final outcome. So what you're looking for when you try it on is more of a like, yeah, this feels okay. Knowing it's going to feel even better once you get those sleeves on and block the sweater. You can also, if you use something like these, you can um, block your yoke and try it on that way. The only thing I don't love about doing that is it does affect, it can affect the size of your stitches. Um, pre-blocked and unblocked so then you're going to continue knitting from there which can feel a little awkward but a steam block can be really nice because then it doesn't like take it all the way but it'll help relax the yoke because some yokes too especially with the increasing and everything that's going on they might not look amazing when you first try it on and then the power of blocking helps like smooth and fluff the yarn and it's just going to lay a lot nicer. So I guess what I'm saying is keep in mind that it's going to look better than it does when you try it on. <laughs> um, so you're just looking for any big red flags or, you know, like if it's too tight or way too big or um, if that yoke depth is just not deep enough. But again, one to two inches under the underarm is a good place to start. Okay, last question. I've only been knitting a couple years, but I love making sweaters. I hate seaming, so generally go for top-down designs, but I've always found that the sleeve stitches get a little stretched out while chilling on hold, resulting in holes on either side when I pick up the underarm stitches. Does this ever happen to you? How do you fix it? Yeah, so I completely know what you're talking about. Um, especially, it can happen where we can tend to get holes um, at the underarm as well. So a couple things. I do love to put my sleeve stitches on hold with a spare cord for my interchangeable needles. And I just put locking ends on there. Um, the thing to consider with that is I think the stiffness of that can kind of pull those stitches a little bit. So again, I like these, um, the Knitting Barber, I'm gonna write myself a note so that I remember to say that in the notes. Um, didn't I say something else too? Maybe it was the DRK every day. All right. Uh, sorry about that. Um, I like that these are softer. Waist yarn would also be a great option um, because that is not going to add weight to those sleeve stitches as they're on hold. You could also separate for the body. Oh, that's another thing I want to go back to with yoke fit. So I tend to do two yoke fits. Sorry to backpedal. Um, I do one right away uh, before I split to make sure I like the depth. But then after I'm about an inch into the body or two and a half centimeters, I will then try it on again because once you've actually taken the sleeves like and separated them off, that's also going to change the fit of that yoke. So I think you actually get a better idea of how you're liking that yoke fit about an inch deep. And I'd rather tear back an inch than an entire body. So that's another good checkpoint. 
Um, but one thing you could do with your sleeve stitches, if it, if it is causing a problem and you notice it after finishing the sweater and blocking it, if you feel like there's like kind of some funkiness going on, there's a couple things I would consider. One, that can also be that your um, sleeve gauge is off. So we tend to knit smaller circumference, um, so smaller circumferences at a tighter gauge than bigger circumferences. So while we might be able to use, let's say a US seven needle for the body, if we do that for the sleeves, our sleeve gauge is actually tighter and we need to go up to like a size eight. So you might be seeing that this looks looser up here because it was knit on a bigger circumference. And then you went down to small circumference and you tightened up causing a tightness here. So you get this little looseness up here. So that's one thing to really take note of and watch out for is just gauge and making sure that your gauge is consistent throughout the entirety of your project and adjusting your tool as necessary to keep that consistency. Um, another thing to consider is go an inch into the body, put the body on hold and just knit your sleeves right away. Another great way to see how that yield's fitting. <laughs> um, although who wants to knit their sleeves again after the fact if you had to take that out and make adjustments. But um, yeah, you might just want to do your sleeves first. Um, I feel like, again, there's, it's the underarm that I think causes the spreading where, um, so I think putting the body on hold, it's more stitches and there's no big gap that allows like that kind of whoop opening up. So, um, yeah, that is what I would consider there. So I talked about gauge. Oh, material so doing waste yarn or maybe the barber cords instead of knitting cords i have also seen um some people will actually bind off the sleeve and then they just unzip their bind off and put those stitches back on i kind of feel like that would stretch them out more though so i don't do that but Maybe some of you have and you really love that method. I'd love to hear. Um, I just feel like it's more to then unravel a bind off. Feels like it would tug. Like you use waste yarn to do that bind off and then you just tug that out. But yeah, I, I don't, I feel like that's a lot of tugging on the stitches. So I don't do that. But anyways, that's what I would consider is making sure that gauge stays cohesive and using a softer, less heavy material to put those stitches on hold. I think that's all for questions today. So I am deciding what I'm going to do with the spin portion. Um, I might start doing a different, a separate spinning video and it might only come out bi-weekly. I'm just going to see. Um, things have been real busy as you can see. I'm doing like a lot of organization stuff back there. Um, but we'll see. I don't know. That's what I'm saying. I guess I don't need to talk about it yet because I don't know what I'm going to do. Um, but I do have some fun spinny things today. I <laughs> Here's my sock. Looks a lot, looks really similar to last week uh, because I had a sock on hold. Another pair of these actually that I've decided I'm not going to knit. And so I whipped out my needle and cast on and just got going. And I tried it on and I was like, I know how many rows it takes for me. I've knit these socks so many times that like I know exactly how many rows or rounds I need to get my sock length. And I got there and I was like, huh, this doesn't, you know, I tried it on and I was like, that seems, that doesn't seem like it's hitting at quite the right spot, but meh. and I did the heel anyways, tried it on. I was like, nope, this is too small. Um, so I went back, added length, did the heel again, and all of a sudden it dawned on me, oh my gosh, I had put those other socks on hold with just a random spare needle because I didn't know if I was gonna finish, if I was gonna continue them. And it wasn't the right size needle. I hadn't even looked. So always make sure to check things like needle size. So anyways, I had to completely start over after completely getting through the heel of one sock. Um, but I'm back on track and we're going to have a snowstorm this weekend and I am really hoping to bust out the entire pair this weekend. I have been really busy with work and so I have not been able to do much knitting um, on these. I haven't been able to do, oh, yeah, much knitting in general. I feel like I gotta 
back on my knitting train. Um, but anyways, they are coming along and I love them actually better at this gauge on the bigger needle. So back on track. And I have been doing some spinning. So I showed you, I think two weeks ago, or maybe it was the week before, my kind of thicker spin. And I had so much fun with that. So I am doing another one. I'm hoping to use this for something for my son. These are some of his favorite colors. Um, so I, again, I just wound, um, or I just spun this fairly thick. I think my other one actually is close to a worsted weight, two ply worsted weight, where I'm like, whoa, I really... I really plumped that up. So I have been, I don't think I mentioned this the other week, but I have really been loving rewinding my um, singles and then plying. I find that I love how the colors matching up when I am starting from the same end that I spun the singles from. And I do love that it keeps it a little smoother. You're not roughing up the fiber by going back in the opposite direction when plying. Um, so anyways, I'm letting, these were resting and then, and then I got distracted by the next pretty thing and started a new project, which, um, I kind of wanted to chat about this, about using the precious things that we tend to put up on a shelf or, um, oops, that's not what I'm trying to do. Sorry distracted. I'm just closing this so my battery doesn't die. Right. Um, you know, we tend to buy, maybe it's a really precious skein of yarn or maybe it's fiber. And this happens more now for me with fiber than yarn. But I think that it can happen for a lot of knitters too, where that yarn becomes so special that you don't want to waste it on the wrong thing. And so we kind of put it up on a pedestal, but really all that happens is it just languishes and doesn't get used. And I think that's sad. So I have had this fiber. They are these bats from Artifacts of Appreciation, which just, I brought one of the mini ones so you could see it. Um, Lindsay just does the most beautiful job. It really makes me want to get better at using my drum carter. So if anybody has any good bat making tips, um, I would love to hear them. But her blends are just amazing. I mean, everything that went into this one. So this is my single. And in here, there is Targi Coriadale Baby Doll Southdown. I've never even heard of that. Navajo Churro BFL, um, Yak Merino, Baby Alpaca, Kid Mohair, and some silk. All in this one bat. And these were from, she did special sock bats. So she actually even did little mini bats for the toe and heel, which is this. Sorry, it's a little dark in here today. Uh, but I just enjoyed spinning this so so much and I wish you could see hopefully you can see um it's just beautiful and like the nuance of color in there love it so much so I spun this up over the weekend and last weekend and then I have this amazing braid so as I said I love like blues and oranges together so this is dyed up by my friend Casey over at Port Fiber it's called Xanadu and this is Polworth and Silk and it has been a delight to spin. So I had two of these braids. So I took one and I am spinning it. I split it into four and I'm gonna ply it with this. And I'm just gonna see what happens. So there's part of me that's nervous because I think the reason I tend to do this more with fiber than with yarn is yarn, you can unravel a project. As long as it's not something you had to cut, you know, staking or um, whatnot, then you can just unravel and try again. But with spinning, <laughs> once you spin that fiber, it is fun. And so I was nervous because I'm like, I don't want to waste this like really precious fiber that is so beautiful. But I'm trying to get out of that mindset. And I'm so curious. And I just really love to play when it comes to spinning and exploring that color. And there's so many things I'm curious about that I haven't really dug into yet. 
I, because of that fear and I'm like okay well I'm never gonna know or learn if I don't just do it so that was kind of what happened with my hedgehog fiber spin where I took all that club fiber that is um I used one skein of that in my DRK everyday hand spun sweater I've worn on here and then I used the other skein for the shawl that's coming out and I actually still have one more skein that was a ton of fiber um <laughs> and they're big skeins I mean I have leftover from the one skein I used for this entire large shawl um and I'm so happy I did it and it was so fun. And so I'm really trying to stay in that mindset of like releasing the fear and just giving it a go and seeing what happens. And so I'm really excited. Um, but man, my love of these bats is just like real. So that's what I'm gonna be doing. Hopefully, probably won't have time this weekend, but next week I'm hoping to ply up these bad boys and um, finish spinning the braid of this. I'm almost done spinning the singles and then I'll let them rest and I'll rewind those. And I guess that's all my spinning news right now. I'm trying to organize um, my fiber. That's what those little bins are right there. So it's hard to organize fiber, I realized, because my braids, so many of them have like both warm and cool colors. And so trying to figure out how to organize them has been interesting. But I guess that's all. Tell me some bat tips. I wanna know, do you make your own bats? You know, what, where do you get your supplies? What do you like to include? Do you like the really crazy fun bats or do you like the more neutral tweety bats? I really like these kind of tweety ones. I just think that have like a little hint of color. I like it. All right. I guess that's all. I'm just rambling now. So I am going to end this here, but stay tuned. I will try to film um, a video before the knit along starts. It starts on March 1st. So I'll try and do that video on Monday to kind of talk more about the knit along. And again, sign up for my newsletter. That is the best way to know about all the things. And um, yeah, like there was a pretty hefty discount in there for the knit along. So it's not too late to sign up for that. Again, there's a link below. And I'll see you next week. We are going to be getting some major snow. I'm very excited. So I hope you have a lovely weekend. I hope you get to do some knitting or spinning. Tell me what your weekend plans are. What are you going to cook? Are you going to cook anything good? I'm always looking for good recipes. <laughs> do you have any favorite cookbooks? Ooh, put those below. I, have, I love cookbooks. That's another thing I collect along with fiber and yarn. All right. I am going to end this here, but I hope you have a great weekend. Thank you for joining me for the 50th anniversary no 50th episode and i'll be back next week bye